I think we might start. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today and um, with one of the webinars for National Archaeology Week. I'm Helen Nicholson from the Australasian Society for Historical Archaeology and our talk today is by Richard Tuffin on the preliminary results of an archaeological investigation of the Port Arthur convict workshops. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the land which I'm speaking to you from, land that always was, is and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd like to acknowledge elders past present and emerging, and First Nations people, wherever they may be zooming in from or be um, listening to this today. Richard Tuffin is a historical archaeologist currently working as a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of New England. He's worked as a research and commer commercial archaeologist in Australia, the Pacific, and in the UK. And um, he's going to be speaking today about work that has been undertaken there in Port Arthur. Labour was at the heart of Convict Australia. It had defined the lives of all sentenced men and women, much more so than episodes of brutality um, and inhumanity, which tends to capture people's imaginations today. In this talk, he'll be discussing the archaeological investigations recently carried out at the Port Arthur Penal Stations workshops, where prisoners had once been employed in an array of skilled trades, shoemaking, tailoring. He's going to have a lot more to say about what they were up to there. The excavations proved to be both methodologically and logistical, logistically challenging. Uh, so let's hear what Richard has to say about his work he's undertaken. Thank you, Richard. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Helen, for the intro. I'm sorry about the big word logistically. I'm sure there's going to be many I'm going to stumble over. Um, yeah, and thanks to Asher for inviting me to this talk today. Um, now, I just want to start off by saying I am the face of this talk, but it's a co-authored paper or talk with myself and Savannah Sidgick from the Port Arthur Historic Site Management Authority. So she is here in spirit, if not in Zoom. I don't think she is. Um, so hopefully, there we go. So it's another talk about Port Arthur. So it's, oh God, not more Port Arthur stuff. And me in particular, you're probably thinking, Richard, can't you do anything else other than convicts? And the answer is, well, yes, I do some other things, but this is what you know, really quite excites me. Um, yet you're all here, you're eager to learn, uh, and there's actually still quite a lot to be learned about good old Port Arthur, from its untapped archival records uh, to reinterpreting all its built fabric, as well as all those lovely archaeological deposits just waiting to be painstakingly destroyed. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the most recent work that we've been doing, uh, which is the investigation of the Port Arthur workshops. There hopefully is a map of the Tasman Peninsula. Hopefully you all know where Tasmania is, the peninsula, and there's Port Arthur, and there's the penitentiary right down there, which uh, is where the investigations were focused. Uh, we're going to talk about work within that precinct, and we're going to talk about work within, to be exact, the workshops area. And that was situated to the west or the right in that picture right there uh, of the penitentiary building. Um, and you can see there, there's a elevation which was drawn in about 1863 of that workshops complex at its height. And we're gonna be learning a lot more about that today. So let's just have a brief look at the excavation background. So as with all good projects, um, there was a lot of people involved. This was a collaborative exercise between Port Arthur Historic Sites and the University of New England, represented by me. Uh, so including myself and Silvana, the key players are all uh, shown here, uh, particularly Dr. David Rowe, who was instrumental in getting this work up and executed. Um, 
But first of all, let's have a look at some of the background about this whole penitentiary precinct and the project to which this is attached. Now, this uh, conservation project was planned in, in general terms, but it was promoted up the calendar by a big storm surge event in July of 2012. And there's a dramatic picture there of the waves crashing over the seawall uh, in front of the penitentiary. Now, after this, engineering assessments highlighted the alarmingly low strength of parts of this building. Um, and what has resulted today is a relatively simple and quite elegant solution. Or, well, we seem to think so anyway. Now, accompanying this engineering works were a whole series of archaeological investigations, which were designed to mitigate the invasive nature of these works. Uh, it was also a chance for us to increase knowledge about the underexplored parts of Port Arthur's rogue grinding machine, if you will. Uh, now, the penitentiary precinct has the longest sequence of occupation at the Port Arthur site. So it goes from its 1830 establishment, and I should just get up a little pen there. Hopefully this will work. So this is sort of the world of shops, uh, workshops precinct that we're looking at. Uh, so from there, we get the expansion of the workshops in that waterfront area. We get the addition of a flour mill and granary in 1842. And then the conversion of that mill into a major prison in 1856 until its final abandonment in 1877 and the destruction of the penitentiary by bushfire in the 1890s. So as well as all that mitigation and stabilization works within this penitentiary precinct, in 2016, we also conducted open area investigations of the ablutions and the laundry area. So hopefully that's all moving for you. Um, this ablutions area was located at the rear of the penitentiary. These excavations took seven months. They were a total of 850 square meters and this incorporated areas encompassing exercise yards, washing toilet blocks, laundry, wood stores, and a big boiler area. Uh, so this ablutions and laundry area met the needs of the 480 men who were incarcerated within the penitentiary itself. Now, as you saw at the start of this clip, the area pre-excavation resembled not much more than a convict tennis court, uh, and it didn't really show how much of an integral part of the penitentiary's facilities it was. But it was clear upon stripping back that there was a high preservation of features and deposits beyond what we'd been expecting. Anyway, that was the ablutions and the laundry excavation, and we're not here to talk about that particular excavation. We came, we saw, and we wrote a book. It's 280 pages, copious illustrations, colour plates, witty wordplay, yours for the reasonable price of between 30 to 40 bucks. And it's been described as forensic, significant and impressive, thanks to Susan Lawrence. Um, anyway, let's get on to the workshops proper. So as with all good archaeological excavations, the excavation program was underpinned by some very serious and what we think are very clever questions. Uh, for the Port Arthur Historic Site, the whole of the penitentiary precinct work was carried out in adherence to its conservation, interpretation and research goals. The penitentiary building, as I said, needed massive stabilisation works and these caused uh, marked uh, subsurface impacts which required that mitigation I mentioned. Uh, at the same time, a decision was taken to recover as much research value as possible with questions targeted at the hidden lives and labours of Port Arthur's unfree population. Then there is the need to interpret these results in a public facing and scholarly fashion. Now from the research side of things, uh, we've got the investigation of the workshops presenting a fabulous chance to engage with convict labour. So since 2017, we've all been part of an Australian Research Council project team, which has been investigating the impact of convict labour on the environment of the Tasman Peninsula and also vice versa. So using historical research, remote sensing, archeological survey, GIS visualization analysis, we've been reconstructing former landscapes of timber getting, quarrying, brick making, all of the stuff that goes into that. So this work was concentrating on the wider landscapes of convict labor. So the hinterlands of those stations and the outstations, but the excavation of the workshops actually provided us with a real chance to continue this research trajectory, but focusing on a much finer scale on the processes and the products of unfree labor. 
So as such, the questions underpinning the archaeological aspect of the research revolved around understanding how the space was used, how it evolved, what type of products they were making, as well as the complexity of the labor tasks which were all involved. So those are the four simple questions. So you're all clever. I'm not going to bore you too much with the detailed history of the site. I'm going to take you through a few quick slides. So what we're seeing here is, first of all, an outline of the intended excavation area, and you'll learn more about that in a second. And the blue outline is actually what we investigated in higher detail. So that's just orienting you to our excavation area. So this is in about 1830 uh, or 1831, when two workshops have been constructed on the waterfront. It started out as one, which was the blacksmith, and it was a prefabricated structure, which was bought with them when they first uh, settled in the area. By, oh, this is an illustration from 1833, one of my favorite illustrations of Port Arthur. And what we can see here is that workshop structure just situated there on the edge of Mason Cove, and you can see that bush sort of encroaching onto the settlement. It's all stringy bark and blue gum, this little settlement sort of clinging to the edge right there. From 1835, the workshops undergo some form of expansion, and this is a plan of it in 1836, and you can see it's really expanded by that time. So you've got tailors, shoemakers, carpenters, blacksmiths, all working within this precinct. It becomes the labor hub for Port Arthur. Uh, here's a really nice plan, uh, section and elevation of that workshop. So you can see it's weatherboard, uh, hip shingle roof and set on reclamation right up against the waterfront of Mason Cove. In the 1840s, the workshops are truncated at their western end, oh sorry, by the eastern end where the uh, flour mill and granary was built. And you can see the treadwheel ward just peaking in there. And that was part of that big complex. And in 1844, the blacksmith itself was relocated to either the shoemakers or the carpenter's shop. And remember that that's going to be something that will come up later. Uh, here's a terribly small illustration of the site. I probably should have blown it up, but we've got the flour mill and granary and the workshops just there situated on the edge of the waterfront there. And of course, notice the convicts working very hard at the front of that image. Uh, jump ahead about 10 years. 1855 to 59, there's a complete remodeling of the workshops and you can see how much it expands. It just turns into this big industrial complex at this time. It retains most of its functions, uh, but things have been moved about. Uh, you get the installation of a boiler, which feeds a steam sawmill, as well as some of the activity happening in the blacksmith and the foundry shop. And you can see that blue area of the excavation. That's one of the buildings that we're gonna be focusing on uh, during this talk. Here's a plan of that complex in 1863 as well, just showing some of the activities that are going on. And if you pay particular attention, you'll see in the founders and the blacksmith area, we've got what's called a casting furnace and then a forge situated within the building as well. Uh, this is a nice 1877 photo. Uh, this is pretty much how it stayed till the end of the settlement. Uh, this collection of roof lines down there is the workshops complex just there to the west of the penitentiary. It was all demolished in the 1880s uh, and it was then burnt over in the 1890s bushfires. But after that, the site was never built on. So there's been no buildings after the convict period, which is what we like to hear. So armed with our very clever questions, uh, fortified by our historical research, we advertised for and picked a professional crew. So this excavation was going to run for seven months through the course of 2020, which is a year that has now gone down in infamy. Uh, we had a crew of five, which was gonna be deployed for three months each. So here's the first of those chosen five, the final five that we selected. And during March, we started cleaning back the machine topsoil. So you can see that bottom illus, uh, photo there showing that little 12 ton machine just stripping back the topsoil. And what that is doing is it's just exposing all the demolition and the upper surfaces of the footings. And things were beginning to look very, very promising indeed. Then COVID hits, site shuts down, everybody has to go home. So Silvana and I got to twiddle our thumbs for six months with the whole program thrown into complete and utter disarray. But what we did was we mothballed the site. So you can see all that geofabric down the bottom there that covered the whole area, meaning that it kept down the weeds and all the nasty things that get into a site, means it wasn't exposed to the elements and it was ready for us to revisit. 
which is precisely what we did six months later in October 2020. But by that time, the money had gone to pay for the crew, so I was up to Sill and myself to excavate the site by ourselves. So this, of course, meant there had to be a massive rejigging of our excavation plan. We couldn't excavate that big 880 square meters that we were planning. If we had been doing that, we would still be going, we'd still be there now and going completely mad. So instead, what we did was we decided to focus on one of the key workshop structures. And as you can see from the outline here, it was the 1850s blacksmith and foundry, which had formerly been the shoemakers in the 1830s and the 1840s. So this shrunk that area to a much more manageable 165 square meters. So we were off and racing, or at least we were crawling along. Um, and the methods we were using nicely supported the fact that there were just two of us. So in addition to the fact that we had an awesome single person robotic total station, which we were able to use, uh, we had also well and truly entered the age of photogrammetry. Um, we still recorded sections the tried and tested way, but general site planning and illustration was done through photogrammetric capture. So the resulting images from this recorded the excavation progress, as well as provided bountiful information about stratigraphic relationships and composition that we otherwise might miss. And these are images that we can keep referring to. Uh, Paper-based recording was also out the window. So we were using Panasonic Tough Notes to record context and keep registers, as well as take uh, and annotate all our sketch plans. So you know, good for just two people working on the site. And this has become old hat on most excavation sites these days. So to put it relatively politely, this dam site is one of the trickiest that we've ever excavated. So not only were we required to do all the directing, recording, excavation, artifact processing during the 10 month excavation, the site itself was archeologically irritating as well. Logistically, it was a doddle. We only had one live service line to contend with and no angry workies. And here's a shot showing that service line running straight through our site. Um, visitors were kept at a respectful arm's length. You can see the fence up there where we were uh, uh, situated behind. Um, and the visitors were fed a diet of information through on-site interpretation and tours. Um, and though we were always under constant observation, we were mostly pretty well behaved. However, stratigraphically, the site was a complete and utter mess. Though post-convict impacts were supposed to have been minimal, remember that history said that there'd been nothing built there after the fact, it turned out that the impacts have been anything but minimal. So here's a sneak peek of the excavated site at the end of the program. You can see that service trench cutting a two meter wide and 1.5 meter deep swathe through the middle of the site. Uh, it destroyed important elements of the original waterfront seawall, as well as completely cut off the northern part of the site. So this side of things, from the southern side there. So we weren't able to work out the relationships between those two aspects of the site. Uh, the whole center section of the site had also been completely scoured away and we don't know how, completely methods unknown. So here deposits went from post 1877 demolition interface straight to early period bills and reclamation from the 1830s. So that meant, of course, that working out relationships between one half of the 1850s blacksmith and foundry from the other became exceptionally difficult. But perhaps the most head scratching and annoying aspect of the site was its lumpiness. So we all know that getting a nice layer cake of a site is an unrealistic dream. However, this site was at the other extreme. We had deep undulations right across the site height, uh, site, sorry, and you can sort of see this here dips down like that, big undulations. These are up to about a half a, a meter to a meter in height difference. And this meant that later deposits were deeper than earlier deposits in some instances. So we initially, as you would, treated these as cuts, uh, but it eventually turned out that uh, these undulations were caused by something else entirely, which I will discuss later. So though the reasons for these lumps was pretty cool in the end, it did make for difficulties, frustration, and just a few tantrums on my part. So let's get into the excavation proper. So as predicted, the excavation found evidence from all stages of the pre and the post convict occupation. 
Now, the few maps and descriptions we have of Port Arthur in its earliest years indicate that Mason Cove was originally ringed by a rocky dolerytic shore. And at the head, the dolerite gave way to tidal sandy flats across which ran a small stream, which was cunningly known as Settlement Creek. Though much of the cove was then overprinted by later development, there are still sections of this original shoreline that we can still see today. So if you're paying attention during the history, you would have noticed that around 1835, the workshops were situated right by the water's edge. And this later 1836 section by Henry Lang shows that profile of the shore. So he actually neatly recorded the natural profile of the shore coming through there under the reclamation. So though we're unable to completely expose the shoreline across the whole site, we did find evidence of it in a series of slot trenches that we excavated. So as indicated by the section you can see below, the shoreline sloped relatively sharply to the north. Uh, it was formed from clay sand and dolerite, and it graded into a very nice fine sand towards the base of the slope, which was of course, those tidal flats of the cove. So, you know, quite interesting, but so far relatively unexciting. But slightly more interesting was the presence of an enigmatic stone platform, which was situated just south of the waterfront. So that waterfront alignment probably came just through there, through the site. Um, and you can see where the stone is in relation to that. So this structure was formed from field collected dolerite, uh, and it may have served as a foundation or a working platform. There are no footing trenches or post holes for superstructure, which are associated with this thing. Uh, those post holes you can see up in that inset photograph, they are from the post convict period, conveniently dug through the thing. Um, so we do know that those first workshops from the 1830 to about 1833, uh, they were set back from the water's edge like these, this stone platform. We also know that the first building was a prefabricated hut, which would have been brought with them that would have required minimal interference with the ground. So are we in fact looking at one of the earliest structures from the convict period at Port Arthur? Uh, Dolorite here used, used at Port Arthur pre-1833 and is usually a marker for very early development. So, you know, at this stage, I'm going to say yes, yes, it is the earliest structure of Port Arthur because it makes a much nicer story. Uh, so in the 1830s, they begin that process of reclamation. They dump Dolorite fieldstone from nearby field clearance and clays from when they're terracing the waterfront. And as part of this, a series of large timbers are placed parallel and perpendicular to the line of the waterfront. And you can see those uh, orange blocks there are showing where those logs would have been relocated or been located. Now, this form of re uh, reclamation, as you guys probably all know, is called log cribbing, and it was commonly used at Port Arthur as well as many other places. And this involved the creation of log boxes into which was dumped spoil, and it was a quick and easy way of reclaiming and building up a waterfront. And this illustration here from the Port Arthur dockyards in the 1850s shows just some of that reclamation there. And it's being dismantled at this particular point in time, but you can see the outline of the logs that are forming that reclamation. And these reclamation logs, it turns out, are why the site was so difficult to excavate. These are why we had those undulations. Because instead of nicely staying in place, like this log here, which was below the penitentiary, these logs under the workshops had disappeared without trace. Well, they'd gone. Uh, the resulting voids had been filled with all the overlying deposits from the convict and the post-convict period. So this is why we were finding late period deposits at those strange depths. So the question of course is, well, what happened to the logs? We did find small deposits of organic matter at the base of the voids, but that is all that remained. So we think, well, had the logs rotted out? Uh, though quite tidal, the below ground conditions were actually conducive to the survival of timber because we did find well-preserved timbers in other parts of the site. Now the presence of charcoal within some of these voids points to a more likely explanation, and that is that these logs actually burnt out. So as I mentioned, after the salvage of the site in the late 1880s, uh, bushfire swept through the site in the 1890s. So it's not inconceivable that fire got into these below ground timbers uh, and proceeded to smolder and burn until the logs were completely consumed. And we had some very good evidence of this with these photographs here. One of the logs uh, 
yeah, you could see, see all the burnt bark on the outside of it. And you can see how those deposits have just collapsed into the void once that log has just completely gone. So yeah, in this case, everything slumps into the resulting cavity. And that photograph on the right there is of the forge base, which I'll talk about in a bit. And you can see nicely intact section on the left. And then you can see where it's just collapsed into that resulting void. So turning our mind back to that history, uh, around 1835 to 36, a whole new range of workshops were constructed. Um, and all that reclamation I was talking about was likely associated with this workshops construction. So once again, here's Henry Lang's section to show how these structures related to that reclamation. Um, but unfortunately, during the excavation, evidence associated with the 1830s and the 1840s workshops is very scant, to say the least. Uh, and we guess this is what happens when, during the later phase of 1850s, a large and very robust blacksmith and foundry complex is plonked right on top of it. However, what we did find from this earlier phase is quite interesting. So directly overlying the reclamation clays was a thin layer of rich silt, and that's marked by those red arrows there. And this was absolutely chock-a-block full of ferrous concretions and window glass. And as it turns out, a lot of the concretions appear to be tack nails, obviously for shoes and boots. And if you remember, the newly converted workshops range was used by the shoemakers from at least 1835. So, you know, that was quite a nice find and a direct link to that shoemaker's occupation. We also found two brick footings running parallel with where the northern wall had been. Um, this had been cut by later sandstone footings of the foundry. Currently, we've got no idea what these footings were for. Uh, there was a chimney supposedly in the area, um, so it could have been that, uh, or it could be support for timber elements within the workshops. That's a work in progress. Um, but apart from that, that was pretty much it for the shoemaker's phase of occupation. And that was, well, at the time, and still is a little bit, a bit of a letdown. However, in a boost to our spirits, we did find evidence of something which had only been enigmatically mentioned in historical sources. So as I mentioned in 1844, the blacksmiths either relocated to the former carpenter shop or to the shoemakers. Uh, and evidence of the excavation strongly supports the theory they, were, they moved to the shoemakers area. Now that occupation deposit associated with the shoemakers at this time was covered by a thick layer of crushed sandstone and sand. And that's that yellow band you can see there called the leveling fills. And the sand is that nice gray layer just below that brick crush there. So with the workshops leveled, by this material, the surfaces of brick was laid across the eastern extent of the space. And you can see that outlined there in that uh, illustration. Now these brick surfaces had been pretty much worn out completely. They were almost flat from continual use. And you can tell from those photos on the left there, they don't amount to much and they're quite hard to spot. And this surface was covered by a very thin layer of coal, charcoal and metal fines. So pretty much what you would expect from a blacksmithing deposit. And over in the Western extent, it appears that at least part of the structure was converted into a sandstone flagged area uh, with some brick footings also associated with it there. Uh, and this is a later 1863 plan of the space. And it does indicate that you had some form of casting activity, most likely copper alloy happening in this area. So even though this is from 20 or so years later, uh, we are beginning to think that, yeah, that was perhaps what was happening in this area from when they converted it into the blacksmith. But again, it's still a work in progress. Preliminary results, that's the key. Um, just south of that flagged area, there's a thick layer of yellow clay, which was also introduced. Uh, and this had been deposited directly over all the leveling material, as well as that shoemaker's uh, occupation deposit. Now this clay had a series of enigmatic depressions within it, as well as smaller stake and post holes situated throughout. And you can see that illustration up there with a the false color, just to sort of show you the depth of those undulations in that clay. Now, currently we are not entirely sure what we're looking at. The one hypothesis we do have is that it was a casting area. So we have little evidence in this particular spot for melted metals, though the clay itself does show signs of having been affected by heat. 
Now, these could have been depressions in which casting molds were set with stake and post holes related to the creation of formwork or the installation of casting boxes. Um, if anybody's got any ideas, I'm happy to hear them because we're still figuring that one out. Um, work in progress. So the leveling layer, the brick and the sandstone surfaces and the clay layer that I just talked about was pretty much it for our 1840s period. There was no sign of any smithing, casting, metalworking uh, equipment or furniture. Uh, it was great to confirm that the shoemaker's shop had been converted to a blacksmith. Um, and that work had resulted in the wholesale reflooring of the space. And it was likely to do with all that hot work that needed to take place. However, it's the next phase that will provide us with the most evidence for convict period metalworking. So during this phase, the workshops got a sexy major revamp. Now, whilst they did adhere in parts to the footprint of the former workshops, the composition and the form completely changed. For one, the former timber footings were completely replaced by new sandstone ones. And you can see them outlining the space there. Uh, these did largely follow the outline of the former shoemakers and then blacksmith shop. Um, but of course, the replacement of these footings meant that the whole superstructure of the workers' core would have, workshop's core, would have had to have been completely rebuilt. Uh, but from the looks of it, they did actually keep the configuration from that earlier spatial usage during the blacksmith phase. So in the east, uh, where there'd been those earlier deposits of coal, charcoal and iron, they had been overprinted by yet more deposits of coal, charcoal and iron. And associated with this was the construction of a brick and rubble mortar base, as well as the cutting of two large pits. Now, this brick and rubble mortar base was about three by two metres. It was located in a spot where that contemporary plan, which you can see up in the top left there, indicates there had been a forge and chimney. So we're in that particular spot just up there. And there's no reason to doubt that this feature was in fact not a forge base. Uh, and you can see on the um, right there, there's a orthographic plan of it. And it just sort of shows it's a bit of a mortar splodge. And then you can see there a section cut through it that it actually was relatively substantial, but not particularly deep, just cut into that reclamation layer. Now, the pits that I talked about were also likely associated with the forge. Now, these were filled with a mixture of contemporary charcoal rich deposits, as well as later demolition debris. And these pits were in exactly the right situation for an anvil. Uh, the likelihood of this position is further increased by the fact that charcoal, coal and iron fines have been compressed into really hard layers around the pits. And you can see the extent of that compacted area just to the south of the pits there. So though we don't know for sure, it does suggest that that compaction suggests continual use. And that could have been the presence of a couple of strikers and the blacksmiths working at the forge and working at the pits. And it was the only area that was so heavily compressed. And yeah, so we think that was just from continual use. And you can see a nice little quote there um, from a bit of an earlier period, just talking about you know, those convict men working at the anvils. Now, during the excavation, we collected about 360 soil samples from about 90 convict period deposits. Now, these soil samples are currently getting tested using the PXRF machine at UNE, which basically means we're testing the soil for its metal composition. Now, preliminary results from this uh, indicate that the smithing area was, yes, a smithing area. So if you have a look at the concentration of iron that we're getting, we're getting big returns of iron in that particular area where the uh, forge was situated. So just as you can see on this photogrammetry, forge is there and the anvil we think was situated there. And this is where we're getting our concentration of iron coming through. Uh, for copper alloy, we're getting similar hotspots occurring around the smithing area. And it's very clear early days of this type of analysis, still got quite a few samples to process. We are looking at a mix of metal based activity types occurring in the eastern extent of the shop where you had the forge and what we think was the anvil. And speaking of the anvil, we actually managed to find an anvil. So the site had a confusing array of pits. Now, none of these contained built furniture to indicate how they were used. Many contained slag and what we think of 
uh, well, what we think is smithing hearth bottom, which is basically the accumulated waste that's scooped out of the forge at the end of a day or a week's worth of work. Uh, some or all of these pits may have related to casting activity. Now, one of these pits situated in the center of the site contained an anvil sitting happily upside down in a puddle of tidal water and covered with demolition debris from the 1880s and 1890s. Now, though there is no direct evidence that it was an anvil from the convict period, the likelihood is incredibly high that it does date from the 1850s to the 1870s. We do know the shop was used during the 1880s by workmen who were dismantling the penal station, but it's highly unlikely that they brought their own ambles with them to do this. Uh, we also have no record that ambles were removed from the site as part of the wind down operations in the 1870s. And we do have some inventories which list the uh, tools and equipment that were removed from the site as the station was beginning to wind down and there is no ambles recorded in that. So anyway, the anvil was recovered by these two strong gents uh, and it was attended to by our favorite conservator and it's currently sitting in a stabilizing bath in preparation for uh, clever electrolytic treatment. And some of you might be noticing the fact that the anvil is square headed. That is because it has lost its horn, which um, is possibly why it ended up in, in a hole in the first place. And talking to people who know about anvils, the loss of a horn is actually something that can occur. It seems very strange to us because it's such a solid object, but they can actually be relatively easily uh, broken off an anvil. So when this thing's been treated, what we're hoping we can see is some maker's marks to tell us where it's from. We potentially might get it uh, from Port Arthur because we know it's listed in some of the manufacturing returns that they did make their own anvils there. So is this a Port Arthur made object? Well, let's wait and see. So shifting over to the west of the site, we've got that former sandstone paved area that continues to be used. We've got that plan from the 1860s, which show they're using it as a casting furnace. Uh, we're getting some relatively high copper returns in the area, the copper alloy, sorry, which is sort of indicating that yes, this is copper casting that's going on. Uh, so yeah, again, we're not quite sure about what's going on in that area, but it's highly likely that yes, it is a casting area. And what was very interesting was that earlier layer of clay over in that corner, uh, which had all those undulations, which we found where we think the possible earlier casting was taking place. This was covered by layers of clean silt at this time. And a brand new layer of clay was put down in which at least three pieces of metalworking equipment were set in the clay. And you can see there the location of the equipment is outlined by those orange polygons. What these pieces of equipment were is we have no idea. However, we do know they were large and they involved hot work with the clays having been affected by heat. Although there was very low presence of coals and charcoal in the clay. Um, we get to process the soil samples from these deposits. So all we can say is that some form of hot work was taking place in this Western extent of the shop, potentially associated with the sandstone platform and potentially associated with the working of copper alloys. So that's pretty much where we're going to leave the excavation. We know from the history that the blacksmith and foundry slowly went out of use with fewer and fewer men working in it. As mentioned during the post-convict period, it was briefly used by men involved in salvaging the penal station uh, before the building itself was salvaged. They did a pretty good job of this, uh, leveling the site to its foundations and leaving nothing behind but those very disturbed occupation deposits. Now, here's a typical artifact tray from a day of excavation. Ugh, so much metal. Um, yeah, so many of these finds were metal, in particular ferrous. Uh, it's to be expected. We are excavating a foundry and we are, of course, prepared for this because we're good little archaeologists. Um, as soon as these ferrous objects were excavated, they were taken to our nearby lab. They're cleaned and using food grade nitrogen, they were placed in a low oxygen environment, which effectively halted the corrosion process. And we trialed this process during the previous penitentiary excavations. So we knew it would provide the best care for the objects during that crucial period after first being unearthed. All of the ferrous objects were x-rayed. And this of course is no new approach in archeology, span um, but the radiography does enable us to identify otherwise unidentifiable objects. And also records uh, basic data across this whole ferrous assemblage, 
which would have not been recoverable by other realistic methods. Now, the X-ray images provide a real opportunity to interrogate these ferrous concretions. So for example, with the nails, which were particularly prominent, we've engaged historic nail specialist, uh, Chris Howe. So Chris is slowly making his way through all of our digital images of these X-rays. And though again, early days, Chris has identified the form, function, manufacture of many and varied nail types at the station. We've got floor spikes, floorboard nails, horseshoe tacks, Flemish tacks, screws, um, you know, all the nails and screws that you could possibly want. Uh, and Chris has also found evidence of both British and Australian forms of manufacture. I don't know how he identifies it, but that's his speciality, um, as well as the possibility of needle making on site. Now we also recovered lots and lots and lots and lots of offcuts, mostly copper alloy and lead. Uh, these had mostly been cut from various strips of sheet metal. Uh, and as you can see on the left there, we also got quite a lot of um, offcuts where things have been stamped out of them. And on the right there, you can see an example of some more formed objects such as rivet heads. And your eye is also probably drawn to that love heart that we've got there. That's a very interesting enigmatic feature. It was clipped out of a lead sheet. Um, was it to be used as decoration on something? Was it to be presented to someone? We don't know, but I'm sure we could make up some very interesting stories to do with that. Anyway, we're archeologists. We love our stories. Um, so in addition to those other finished objects, oh, as in you know, things that are recognizable, we have those copper alloy nails. Uh, we also have lots of half completed objects. So you've got this collection on the left of faceplate, escutcheon, lock plate, disc, several brackets, a rivet. Um, so whilst it's likely that these things are being produced in the foundry, we don't know for sure. And further investigation is meant to include some further materials analysis, and that will hopefully confirm this. So another of our experts, Dr. E. Jean Harris, has confirmed we found fragments of up to 19 crucibles. So these are made of graphite, clay, and other additives, and style of container used for melting and casting non-ferrous alloys since at least the 16th century. Um, the copper alloy residues pointed to the use, of course, for copper casting. So don't think in this particular illustration, but yes, some of the crucibles had evident copper alloy sort of running down the side of it. So again, that's supporting the idea of copper casting. Um, and I haven't mapped these finds yet to the site to work out well what particular side they were coming from. Um, down the bottom right there, you can see some pieces of whetstone that we recovered. Again, it's a blacksmith foundry, uh, not to be, not unexpected. Uh, we also recovered a variety of tools as well. So on the left there, you've got some tool bits, as well as on the right, you've got some handles in which things like those tool bits would have fitted. So you've got you know, bits and punches, handles, all that type of thing. And here's a nice big set of blacksmith tongs. And as you would imagine, these were found accompanying the uh, anvil that we found. So it had been chucked in the hole first, and then the anvil had been chucked pretty much on top of them. Uh, so the hard to see, but the nipper end of the tongs is situated on this side. So it's just missing one nipper, but otherwise you know, it's as good as if it had been made yesterday. So we found a number of unexpected finds. Um, we still got heaps to do in terms of analysis, though we've got a few things that are standing out. Uh, this is a fragment of ivory from a sperm whale tooth, which displays prominent saw marks. And this is found in addition to several other fragments of cattle sheep and unidentified large mammal bones. Uh, and this is of course evidence that bone and ivory working is taking place throughout the workshop's operation. And then on the right there, uh, this is quite nifty, but we've actually got some layers of pressed organic sheets, which is a nifty way of saying paper. So we know book binding is happening at Port Arthur. Uh, it's odd that it's happening in the foundry space, um, but again, I haven't worked out what particular phase this relates to. So it could be that earlier phase. Um, so this is possibly marbleized book binding as well, just a tiny, tiny fragment of it. And then of course, we found some coins, uh, which made the news because everybody loves the T word treasure. Uh, where that location is here, just down there, there was a stack of coins and literally it was a stack of coins 
shoved into the clay. And I was the lucky person who found it just matticking along. And I heard a chink and looked down and there was some silver. Uh, so they dated from about 1820s to 1844. And you can see some of them there on the left, heavily, heavily worn, have been in circulation for quite some time. No, they aren't token blanks, but they are just heavily worn. And what's quite interesting is we know the layer of clay they're from. And if you remember, that clay is where we had those impressions of the equipment. So it looks like these coins have been deliberately put into the clay behind where you would have had this equipment. So are they being hidden? We don't know the exact story, but we can sort of, again, make up a relatively interesting story about it. And 20 shillings um, is about the wage of an overseer at this time. So it's about a week's worth of money there. So has it been pilfered and hidden and the convict never came back to get it? We don't know. So yeah, quite a nifty thing there. So just in closing, it's very much a where to from now. So as you hopefully can tell, we've managed to come to grips with the core questions about site development during the convict period, though we still have some very big questions about where and how processes were carried out within the post 1859 foundry. And there is no getting around the fact that COVID massively upset this project, both the scale of the investigation, as well as the post excavation analysis. We lost over a year of labor, as well as funding from a project that had a very well-defined budget and timescale. And we've had to come to, the terms, to terms with the fact that not only did we need to shrink the original grand scale of the enterprise, but that the project will go beyond the project's original life cycle, but finally an archeological excavation that doesn't. Uh, as you can probably tell, the engagement with the finds and the samples is only in its infancy. Uh, building on the work of all our artifact experts, the core of the finds spatial and typological analysis will be completed. However, we feel that we're going to barely touch upon the question of efficiency of processes carried out in the blacksmith and foundry. And that was one of our big questions, if you remember. Because to do this, we need to carry out detailed analysis of the slag, the smithing residues, as well as those finished metal products I've shown you. And this requires archaeometallurgical skills and we do not have those. Um, and the application of archaeometallurgical skills in historical archaeology in Australia is in, it, it is in its infancy. We've been trying to find anybody to help with this and we're coming up blank. So we're having great trouble in pushing that forward. So it's very much a case of watch this space. And again, any ideas on that would be very, very helpful. Now, uh, you all know, hopefully you all know, excavations are hard, they are time and money sinks, and if not careful, they can be a complete and utter waste of time. So what we did by piggybacking off existing research, conservation interpretation programs, we've made sure that the questions we we're asking would lead to answers that cut right to the heart of the convict labor experience. And as I've said, we're getting there. Um, as it should always be, History and archaeology have worked and are still working together to show how unfree labour was deployed in this just this one small corner of the British Empire. And that's pretty much it. So there is a blog you can go and have a look at. I don't update it as frequently anymore. Um, and again, couldn't have done it with a huge amount of people. So I think I'm happy to take questions. But that's me for now. Thank you for listening. That, that was fabulous, um, Richard. So look, if you do have any questions, if you can pop them in the chat or maybe just unmute yourself. I'm not sure how we want to go about this, but um, and we can put them to Richard. Either there's furious typing. Or, uh, look, uh, I can't see anything coming up in the chat. Well, wow, fabulous but... talk, though. Okay, so I, I think you. Any questions you've answered in your talk, Richard? Um, so, we've got a, we've got ah, a yes. question from Tom Barker. He's putting yeah, can you hear me, Deb? 
Oh, okay. We can? Yep. Um, was that a flour mill stone in the centre of your site? It was a large circular. Because <laughs> I, ah, I, you yes. sort of skirted around it a little bit, I think, when you're talking about um, the foreshore. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, yes, the, the big round thing. Um, I'm trying to scoop back to it. Uh, it was not. So when we first uncovered that, there was great excitement because we thought, oh, my God, we've got one of the millstones. Um, but then it quickly turned out that it wasn't. It's sandstone. It doesn't have any iron around it to hold it together like they would usually have. Um, it is, in fact, a relatively ornately made crane base. So I didn't get to talk about the external yard, but that was situated in the external yard, lots of dollarite. Uh, it was called the mechanics yard, and it was situated right where they would have been needing to move heavy things in and out of the back of the foundry. So, yes, it was something I should have mentioned because it always gets attention. Um, and you, every person who walked past was like, what's that? But, uh, yeah, it's strange. It's a very ornately made crane base. It's got a lovely key where they would have put the post, but um, not as an exciting as we thought it was going to be. Thank you. Um, now, Robin Stocks has made the comment that she agrees with the interpretation of the casting clay and suggests that some of the hollows near the forge may be for bellows. Uh, yes, yes. So um, the forge structure, again, we had so few built features during this excavation to run off, but we think the forge would have been well it was there and the bellows we could have had coming from probably we think that western side there with that beautifully drawn arrow that's hopefully showing there so yes some of those pits were potentially associated with that bellows there but again so much that's hard to work out but that's archaeology yes got to have something to keep you working on the site <laughs> oh no we're done now thank goodness now i'm working in the office Huh. There's a few more. Okay, so um, Richard Morrison, you mentioned that the area had the first prefab building at Port Arthur, I think. Wasn't the earliest phase of the Commandant's residence also prefab, about 1830, and still survives inside the present building? Uh, yes, I should have known Richard would be there asking tricky questions. Um, yes, you're right, but you've ruined my good story. Yes, so when they came from Birch's Bay, they brought with them two structures. One was a cottage, which is nestled inside the Commandant's residence, and one was a store, and that store was put in the, uh, yeah, that workshop's area. So can we say they're around contemporaneous age then? I think we'll go with that. Okay, now um, Sue Singleton, uh, has a, she says, a question on the funding. What happened? That's a question for Port Arthur. So <laughs> the, uh, the joys of collaborative exercises is, um, yes, Port Arthur you know, did everything. I just turned up. Um, but it's basically Port Arthur had to shut down for a period and there was a certain amount of budget. Budget only goes for a certain amount of time before the new financial year kicks in and a new budget comes in and money has to be directed elsewhere. So that's basically what happened to that. But I don't want to go too much into Port Arthur's budget. But needless to say, there was not the money to bring a crew in. So we, we got on with things. Um, now, Natalie Butlich, uh says asks... Were the coins set directly into the clay with machinery placed directly over the top or were they in a sort of retrievable cache? They were in a retrievable cache. So uh -huh. here we go. Um, if you can see there, we've got the impressions of the foundry furniture. There was nothing going on up against this southern wall there. So uh, there's no evidence that there was machinery over it. There is just evidence that it was in clay near where machinery had been. Um, so retrievable, yes. Why they weren't retrieved, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the person who pilfered it, if it was pilfered, was sent up to Hobart the next day for, you know, for release. We don't know. For stealing. 
<laughs> anyway, <Yes>. um, <laughs> you're also getting comments. Thank you for a great talk and uh, all the rest of it. So um, awesome. they're you. coming in. But do we have any more questions for Richard? Okay, so Richard Morrison has made a comment. Um, we found the logs too in the 1980s beneath the penitentiary tower, but I was wondering whether the possibility, possibly troublesome logs burnt out uh, as a means of removal in the restructuring when the sandstone foundations were built in the workshop. Uh, can't quite... Uh dismantle that question um i think is it were the logs removed instead of burnt maybe um no. in in which case the evidence i did think they might have been removed if that's what you're asking but the evidence is that the, you have that slumping and the key was the fact that the foundry forge base was had slumped down into that depression which indicates you know if you're removing generally everything on top of it's going to be disturbed and yeah. the fact you've got that slumpage shows that something has disappeared from underneath, whether by magic or by burning out, and things have slowly slumped down. So, well, that Richard's just sort of qualified saying, were the logs burnt to remove? Oh, burnt to remove. Strange thing to do. Um, no need to do it because by that time, the reclamation is set so far back because in the 1850s, they fill in the whole bay that to do that and then just have this weird depression would have made no sense whatsoever. Okay. Okay. So that looks, there are lots of, um, you know, interesting talk, right? Can't wait to see more re research done and, and comments like that for you, Richard. But I don't think there are any more questions. Yeah. So I'm stoked so I many people like turned up. To, oh, just a minute. I'm just looking over here. I oh, know. So what we might do, I'd like to thank you um, for talking today in, our, in the webinar series, the National Archaeology Week. And um, there is a lot more happening uh, the rest of this week. So up there you can see the seminars that are part of the webinar series that you've got to look forward to for the rest of this week. So on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody and um, enjoy Archaeology Week. Thank you.